praise in thy Messiah. Good news the shout about the baby coming to Bethlehem. Oh, we've got good news that celebrate is coming. Good news rejoice with thanksgiving. Good news, glory, hallelujah, Christ the Lord is born. We've got good news. Good news. The, the scripture readings for this third Sunday of Advent are John 9, 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. With the light of Christ in the center of our focus, we can absorb his light in our lives as we stay in fellowship with him and separate ourselves from the world. On this third Sunday of Advent, we light another candle to remind us that we need to take the light of Christ into every area of our lives. Now we direct our attention to more of the obstacles that would hinder the flow of light between Jesus and us. Attitudes play a major role, both in the receiving and the dispersing of the light of Christ. When we allow bitterness or resentment to take root in our hearts, we block out the sunshine of heaven. When we display an ugly spirit, we cast a shadow on our Christian witness. Sometimes it seems that we are powerless to change a wrong attitude. Then we can only pray. Lord, you know how I feel. I don't want to feel this way, but I do. Take my attitude and cleanse it through the power of the Holy Spirit. With a new and proper attitude, we are then ready to receive more of the light of Christ in our lives.
time of God's own choosing he came when we the fight were losing he came long before we knew him when we were lost in sin at the right time at the best time he came. When the night was cold and dreary, he came. To his children worn and weary, he came. To bring us out of darkness, to make us his alone at the right time at the best time he came to the great and to the lowly he came Wicked to the holy, he came that we might know the Father, that heaven we might gain at the right time, at the best time, he came that we might know the Father 
that heaven we might gain at the right time at the best time he This morning's Bible reading is found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And if you'd like to follow along, it is in the New Testament section, starting on page 2 of your pew Bibles. And this is the account by Matthew of the visit of the wise men, or the Magi, to visit the baby Jesus. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. In you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left, left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Well, good morning again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a pastor and a theologian who spoke out very loudly against Hitler and the Nazis. As you might guess, he was arrested and thrown into a concentration camp for speaking out against Hitler. The sad news is, just before the Allies were to liberate the camp that he was in, the Nazis went ahead and executed him. I mean, they knew liberation was coming and they deliberately went ahead and executed Dietrich Bonhoeffer. While he was there in the concentration camp, he wrote a series of meditations about Christians. In one of those meditations, he wrote this sentence, it is not a light thing to God 
that we celebrate Christmas and do not take it seriously. You know, today we delve into the theology of another famous and highly regarded theologian named Dr. Seuss. I'm finding that Dr. Seuss does make some very valid points about how we celebrate Christmas. And today, he makes a point that I have to admit, I quite frankly never thought of as I read the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas or watched the animated version on television. And I confess, maybe I was a bit naive, but, but you know, I always thought of the Who's as this almost perfect little group of creatures. Yeah, I'm going to call them creatures. I'm having a hard time calling them humans. But the Who's were this almost perfect little group of creatures living in peace and harmony together in utopian Whoville. Their society, if you've you've read or seen the animation, their society seemed to run like a well-oiled machine where everyone had a specific role to play and all were valued no matter how great or small their, their contribution to society is. And no matter how menial that job might be, everyone was valued equally. And, you know, if you think about it, in many ways, Dr. Seuss's conception of who society parallels that of the Apostle Paul's description of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yet I want to pose a question as as I think Matt Rawl implies in our book, and that question is this, are the who's really as perfect as they seem? Have you ever wondered why the Grinch believed he could steal Christmas from the Who's by taking away the presents, the food, and the decorations. Could it be the Grinch really believed he could steal Christmas because the Who's were really placing far too much emphasis on the presents, the food, and the decorations? Hmm, maybe Dr. Seuss is trying to convey a message here a message about the who's and how they were missing the point of Christmas. Maybe even celebrating a counterfeit Christmas where Christmas really isn't Christmas. You know, according to a British newspaper called the Romsey Advertiser, there was a warning printed and it read, Christmas shoppers looking for a bargain should be wary of counterfeit goods which flood the market in the run-up to this festive season, the UK border agency has reported. Fake Louis Vuitton purses, fake iPhones, and fake iPads are among the tens of thousands of counterfeit items that are seized by the officers every year. While some people may unwittingly buy counterfeit gifts, the bigger concern is many more people celebrate a counterfeit Christmas, celebrating Jesus' birthday with little thought of Jesus. You know, I don't know if you caught it in the news early last week, but a homeless man in New York City set fire to a news network's Christmas tree that set out in front of its headquarters. Now, you and I know vandalism is nothing new, but what caught my content, my attention, and I have to confess my disgust, is do you know how much they reported that Christmas tree cost? Did anyone see that news story? That Christmas tree cost 500 thousand dollars. Now, uh, you know, this news network is free to do with their money whatever they want, but I think Nanook would ask us, how many blankets could $500,000 purchase? And you know, I can't help but think that Jesus would rather that $500,000 be used to feed the hungry, clothe those who are cold, cold, and to shelter those who are homeless in New York City rather than put up a half a million dollar Christmas tree. 
Now, please understand, I'm not picking on this network. It's just one example of what I think Matt Rawl means when he titled the chapter for this week in our book, When Christmas Isn't Christmas. Unfortunately, many in our society do in fact celebrate a counterfeit Christmas. And you know, this is nothing new. Isn't that really what King Herod is doing in today's task, text? You know, you know the story. He asked the wise men to go and search for this newborn king, for the baby Jesus, and then when they found him, to report back to him so that he too could go and pay homage, presumably with valuable gifts like the wise men did. But we know the rest of the story. We know that was not Herod's intent at all. His was a counterfeit Christmas because his intent was to kill the baby Jesus. In essence, he wanted to be the Grinch that stole Christmas practically before even Christmas had a chance to get started. But thanks be to God, the wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, and they did not. You know, another sign of when Christmas isn't Christmas is this, and forgive me, I don't remember the source. I, I don't know if I read it. I don't know if I heard it on the radio. I don't know if I heard it on the news. But there was an interesting thing that came up in the news as well last week. It re they reported that there's a growing trend in the United States. You, you see, it seems some people aren't happy with just receiving gifts from other people during the Christmas season. But there's a growing trend among Americans for Americans to buy themselves a gift for Christmas. And the average they spend on that gift for themselves, $500. Like the Who's, it seems that a number of Americans are missing the point of Christmas. And, you know, I can't help think, but if the Grinch were to try to steal Christmas in the United States, I believe he would use exactly the same strategy that he proposed to use against the Who's. He would steal all the presents, all the food, and all the decorations. So for me, this begs a question this morning, and that question is, how would we react how would we react as individuals? How would we react as a church if we were to awaken on Christmas morning and find the presents, the food, and the decorations all gone? Would Christmas be ruined? What if on Christmas Eve we walked into this sanctuary to find that all the decorations were gone? Would it ruin Christmas? Now, please understand uh, the distinction I'm making here. We would all be disappointed with the theft, and that's a normal reaction. But would it ruin Christmas for us? You know, this is an implicit question, at least I believe, that Dr. Seuss wants his readers to ask themselves. It's a question that all Christians would do well to reflect upon once in a while. You see, I, I have a very great affinity for Dietrich Bonhoeffer as a theologian, and I agree with his very valid point when he wrote, it is not a light thing to God when we celebrate Christmas and do not take it seriously. It's not a light thing to God when Christmas isn't Christmas when Christmas isn't solely about the birth of the Lord and Savior of the world. Do Christians today take Christmas seriously? On the whole, yeah, I, th I think we do. But I think we also know that there's a lot of people outside the walls of the church who've completely lost sight of what Christmas is really about. It seems for them it's more about the presents, it's more about the food, it's more about the decorations, it's more about the music, it's more about the pageantry. 
they have been taken in by the commercialization of Christmas. Again, I believe most Christians understand what Christmas is really about. And if we came in here on Christmas Eve and found all the decorations were gone, we would still celebrate Christmas, right? We would still go right ahead. We would sing our songs. That is, unless they stole the piano and the organ too. But we would still sing our songs a cappella, wouldn't we? We don't need these decorations. These certainly enhance our praise and our thanksgiving to God for the birth of Jesus, but we would still celebrate Christmas anyway. We would still have our cantata. We would still have our candlelight service because Christmas isn't about things. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak. We all know what Christmas is about, but I think you would also agree that there's a lot of people outside the doors of this church who have really lost sight of what Christmas is about. And that is nothing more and nothing less than celebrating and thanking God for the gift of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. I send you forth from this place now as the people of God, a people who know what Christmas is about. Go forth and share the good news of the true meaning of Christmas with the world. You know, I think it's really telling that there's a trend where people are buying themselves gifts for Christmas. And I don't see that as greed or anything like that. I see it as people trying to fulfill some unmet need in their life. You and I know what that need is, right? It's Jesus. They're trying to fill it with other things. But go forth and share with them the good news that the only way that emptiness within them that will ever be satisfied 
is through a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who came to us as a child. Please be seated and after the postlude, depart in the peace of Christ. <laughs>